I'm delighted to be here this morning as we celebrate the 150th anniversary of this unique school. My name is Don Parker. I grew up in Shirley and moved to Ayer in 1955. I live not far from here on Sandy Pond Road. I went to Ayer High School, then to Worcester State. I came back to Ayer High School in 66 to teach history. I taught for seven years, and then they asked me to come down to the office, and I was assistant principal until 1981, and then I became principal from 81 until 2011. So I was at Ayer for 44 years. I am married to Susan Parker. <laughs> We have two children, Meredith, who lives in St. Louis, and my son, Jeffrey, who lives in West Palm Beach. I'm going to discuss the Sandy Pond Schoolhouse and schoolhouses in general, and then discuss very briefly education and air throughout the years and discuss important events and laws that have really shaped the last few years as to where we are now in air. The Sandy Pond Schoolhouse, as we all know, was constructed as part of Groton in 1869, became a part of Air when Air separated from Groton. And a years of operation were 1869 to 1906. And as Herb mentioned, the 1908 was purchased by the Sandy Pond School Association from the town of Air. The schoolhouse has become a place for gatherings and reunions for alumni throughout the years and continues up to today. S.L. White of Beverly attended the school and wrote the following poem about her early days at Sandy Pond. Oh, the bright sweet days of long ago, when in summer's heat and winter's snow, with my dinner pail well filled with food, with bread, meat, with pie, all things good, I learned to read, write, and how to spell, and several other things as well. In those far off days, no cars were run, neither autos with their speed and fun. Rushing through the city's varied throng, braxing like a moose, both loud and long. Could not talk with others through a wire, or fly above the clouds or higher. The girls wore smaller, plainer hats, fixed their hair without those awful rats. Their skirts allowed walking without harm, and though they dressed not just as old, they were worth today their weight in gold. And yet within this wondrous age, it takes the great wisdom of a sage to live a good life, keep out of debt, and back to look with no regret. And it takes as long to le learn to read, to spell, and to the wisest words give heed. So what was like like in the Sandy Pond schoolhouse. Potbelly stove, pump for water, small student desk. In fact, you know, when I worked at AIR, and people knew where, that I'd come from AIR, I frequently was asked if I went to school here. <laughs> and I thought I saw my name engraved. <laughs> Girls and boys were on separate sides. Toilet paper was the Sears Roebuck catalog. Kids wore buckle shoes. Girls had pigtails. Each child brought a dinner box. Most kids walked a half to three quarters of a mile to get here. On a typical day, students would arrive at 8.45. And even I remember, we started the days off with the Lord's Prayer, Pledge of Allegiance, and remember, and it's always, as a teacher, I just can't imagine the work that teachers had to do in this building. If you had kids from six to 17 or years of age, and you may have had two sixth graders, two second graders, four first graders, and so forth and so on, Number one, to be able to teach and to maintain order. I don't know if we could do that today. I sincerely don't. 
So these folks who taught must have been absolutely marvelous teachers. Subjects were reading, writing, spelling, arithmetic, American history, geography, singing, nature, art, and physical education was really calisthenics. In 1906, there were 18 students. Between 1869 and 1906, there were, I believe, 34 teachers taught in the school. School was not easy. In fact, I'm going to give you an example. Because you, you gotta remember, at school at this time, and again, with the different ages and so forth, a lot of it was based on rote and memorization. It was not teaching for understanding like it's really emphasized today. But I want you to take this test for me. I'm not gonna go through the whole thing by far. Arithmetic, arithmetic. a school enrolled 120 pupils and the number of boys was two-thirds of the number of girls. How many of each sex were enrolled? Quickly. <laughs> How long a rope is required to reach from the top of a building 40 feet high to the ground 30 feet from the base of the building? At a dollar 62 and a half a cord, what will the cost be of, of a pile of wood 20 feet 24 feet long, four feet wide, and 6.3 feet high. This is a test now. Grandma, how many parts of speech are there? Define each. William struck James, changed the voice of the verb. Diagram, you folks remember diagram and sentence? I don't know if we do that anymore. The Lord loveth a cheerful giver. Diagram that sentence. Geography. Locate the following countries which border each other. Turkey of the Ottoman Empire, Greece, Serbia, Montenegro, Romania. Name and give the capitals of states touching the Ohio River. Locate the following mountains. The Blue Ridge, Himalayas, Andes, Alps, and Wasatch. And now into physiology. Again, this is what folks had to do to, when they graduated from high, eighth grade. Not high school, eighth grade. Name the organs of circulation. Where is the chief nervous center of the body? Define cerebrum, cerebellum. Give at least five rules to be observed in maintaining good health. Government, name five county offices and the principal duties of each. Name and define the three branches of the government of the United States. Name three rights given Congress by the Constitution and two rights denied Congress. In the election of a president and vice president, how many electoral votes does each gate allowed? In history, who first discovered the following places? Florida, the Pacific Ocean, the Mississippi River, and St. Lawrence River. Give the cause of the War of 1812 and name an important battle fought during that war. What president was impeached and on what charge? During what wars were in the following battles fought? Brandywine, Great Meadows, Lundy's Lane, and Tetum and Buena Vista. Can you imagine taking that test today? In the eighth grade. I want to talk a few minutes, a little bit about enrollment in air, and then talk about some very, very important laws that were passed in Massachusetts, which really bring us to where we are right now. In 1900, the enrollment in all, in all air schools was 462. Teachers' salary, janitors, and food, $6,954 spent on education. Books, stationery, and all sundries, $921. Teacher salaries were somewhere between $406 and $600. 
there were 16 teachers in the school system. And the superintendent, now I was very, very, this is an, the superintendent split time between Ayer and West Boylston, which is quite interesting. 1920, the number of students goes to 516. Cost of education in air was $20,000. 1930, number of students 514, so it doesn't get too big. Cost of education $47,000. 1940, number of students 652, and the cost of education now up to 51,000. 1950, number of students, 1,002, cost of education, 137,000. In 1960, the number of students has now gone up to 1,973, and the cost of education is 259,000. Remember at this time now, Devons is grow growing and growing and growing. In 1970, the number of students are 3,459. The total expenses, $2,335,848, of which the cost to the town of Ayr was $460,000. The rest was being paid Shirley tuition and what they called PL-874 which is the law under which military schools impact, played impact aid. And then Devons leaves, 1995, 1996. And I remember so well, because I was principal at the time, number of students in the air school system dropped to a 1,150. And remember, that was 3,459. I think we reached the top around 1975 and 1976. In 1996, 32 kids graduated from Air High School. I think we had a football team that year with 18 kids on it. And I can remember at a snowy, snowy day in Westford, we played a Thanksgiving game. And I would imagine that Westford had 60 or 70 kids on their team. I think we had 16. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, the total number of students in, two, in 2011 was 1661. So we've, we've, once the post left, we faced some real challenges. In fact, George Frost, who was a former superintendent here during the last year when Air was all alone, we was very, very concerned that the high school would even would be able to stay open. Because you've got to have X number of kids in a high school that can supply programs. And if you don't have kids, you can't have programs. Well, then there are other things that could be considered. In 1972, the state legislature passed chapter 76, 766, which guaranteed schooling and other services for all students in grades three to 22. Educational services will meet their needs. There will be annual reviews to schools on meeting their needs. This brought on in a whole cadre of new teachers, aides, so forth and so on. And then in 75, they married, the, in fact, they copied the Massachusetts legislation for the federal legislation for No Child Left Behind. In 1990, the IDEA guaranteed free public education in the least restrictive environment, which meant you could not have special ed kid students found out and put in rooms all by themselves. The whole idea was to bring them into the regular classroom. You provide regular education for these kids as best you can. And then in 93, you had the Ed Reform Act, which brought about MCAS. Graduation from high school was dependent upon passing MCAS. It helped to develop charter schools. 
It gave important information in reference to time and learning. You could not count time and learning for kids being in study hall anymore. That was not learning time. There was teacher testing, and most importantly, school and district performance. You, if, if your school kids were not performing up to a certain level over a period of time, the state would take over the schools, as they have, as they have done in several areas. Well, based on that, you've got all this problem of smaller, smaller school here, and then school choice comes along. Now kids can go to any school they want to go to if that school offers school choice. One of my other responsibilities as long as being, well, being a school principal was I took the task of becoming a member of the Shirley School Committee for seven years. And those were very, very difficult times because because of school choice and kids leaving Shirley to go to other schools because we were laying teachers off every year. What happens is school revenue declines because they've got to follow, if your student goes to Neshoba Regional or goes to Lunenburg, that money follows that kid to the following school. Well, if you've got 50 kids going to other schools on school choice, then you have $3 million for your school. That money goes down to the schools because you're gonna pay that. So you get all this happening. Well, thankfully, Aaron Shirley decided that the best way to do this really was to combine forces. Aaron had the problem of not having enough kids. And Shirley had significant problem with not enough revenue. Well, based on that, Aaron Shirley did form they built an absolutely beautiful new school. And I think education is looking very, very positive for the years ahead. But this is where we are. We have a strong number of students and a strong financial base, good partnership. So we can say good things have happened and always have happened in here. Thank you. Thank you.